Hey, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning to all uh, uh, connected uh, from the uh, ASEAN. Uh, and then uh, greetings of the day for the people uh, who are logging in uh, or connecting and signing in from uh, outside the ASEAN regions. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to uh, connect uh, with you and then able to present uh, the topic uh, 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 in the AI Accelerate Festival, Asia Pacific. Uh, welcome once again. And uh, today, uh, today's topic is MLOps and then basically uh, uh, what the MLOps is and then uh, the hardware considerations and implementations on the edge devices. And uh, I'm Munivinay Kamasiti. I'm a senior vice president, a regional head of data for Lazada, uh, currently uh, driving the, uh, the data and AI initiatives uh, for Lazada across uh, the six ventures. And I come up with uh, close to about 15 years of uh, background in the data science, uh, data analytics, and data engineering background. And today I'm going to share uh, my experience uh, in optimizing uh, the machine learning implementations and then some of the hardware related considerations as that topic would uh, suggest. So uh, the knowledge part uh, for today's session is going to look like this. So uh, I'm going to take you through how the ML lifecycle looks like, correct? So what are the different steps involved? And then uh, some of the key challenges, right, uh, with the lifecycle, uh, very high level. And then I'm going to talk about uh, how do we mitigate some of these key challenges using uh, MLOps, machine learning ops uh, introduction. Uh, then uh, followed by which, let's say, if you want to implement the MLOps, uh, you know, what are some of the hardware value chain uh, you know, that, are, that are quite relevant? And especially some of the considerations uh, when it comes to the hardware itself during the various uh, stages of the machine learning, right? Uh, basically, how do you uh, meet uh, machine learning uh, and uh, the hardware so that uh, it would be able to perform a better job uh, than, than it is? And then slowly, uh, I'm going to focus uh, on two important stages of the machine learning, which is uh, you know uh, how the hardware uh, accelerates or probably enhances uh, training a machine learning model. And uh, let's say uh, if you train a model and then when you're deploying it, especially in the edge devices, how does that look like? And then do, especially I'm gonna consider some of the use cases uh, and then uh, talk you through how do we do that, right? And uh, for these use cases, pretty much I'm picking up uh, um, e-commerce uh, background, right? So the drone delivery use case, followed by uh, the mobile implementation. And finally, we could uh, conclude and wrap up. Uh, also, just before we get into the session, a uh, quick uh, 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 you know, update on uh, the type of uh, depth or, or depth of knowledge that you require on the machine learning. So today I'm not gonna go into the coding level, right? I'll probably uh, uh, slicing and dicing uh, uh, a detailed hardware uh, value chain, but rather uh, I'm, I'm gonna keep it slightly at a, at a higher, uh, you know, high level information. And then at the same time, it's not too high level as well. So I, I as, I, as I was mentioning here, uh, explaining the use cases, I, I could go again as, as much as uh, detailed as possible to do that. And uh, prerequisites uh, for uh, this particular session, let's say if you have a very good understanding of uh, what the machine learning is, or even a high level understanding of what machine, machine learning is, and then how it differs from the deep learning and then artificial intelligence. Uh, that that's really good. So basically, then you have right foundation. But in case if you don't have it, it's, it's pretty okay. Always you can take the notes in this session and then go and refer back. Similarly, I'll be uh, uh, you know uh, referring uh, to some of the architecture. So if you have a very basic understanding of IT architecture, uh, uh, especially around the networking and all that, uh, probably you'll be able to relate uh, some of the use cases that I'm that I'm explaining. Uh, uh, and then you could be able to relate uh, some of the uh, topics that I put across uh, easily. But again, you can always go back and refer when you take the notes as part of the session. Okay, let's get started. So first things first, right? Uh, how many of you, uh, rather I would ask this question, right? how many of you have actually implemented that means uh, not just a, a trained or developed a machine learning model, right? How many of you have like really implemented uh, machine learning in production? Uh, so probably you can use the comments and then uh, put your feedback there. So, uh, and then 
I'm sure if, if you implemented the machine learning model in the production, right, it's not in, it's, it's like it goes through all these steps that I mentioned here. So basically you need to have a right data, quality data, correct, an unbiased a quality data to start with because data is the fuel and the electricity, uh, you know, in this, in this case, uh, in this case of the machine learning. And uh, we start with the data, right, uh, uh, for a particular use case. And then uh, once we have the right set of the data, then probably we try to understand uh, what are the different type of machine learning models uh, that we can implement, depending on the business use case, and then depending on the type of data that we have. And then basically we, fin we finalize the model, right? And then build the model. And then importantly, uh, uh, it doesn't end there. Most of the people will get stuck there, right? So basically using some Jupyter notebooks or probably your local machines, you'd be able to download the model. But that does not solve the purpose, right? So maybe you can just use it on your desktop uh, 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 very manually uh, with that model, right? But the real uh, uh, advantage of this, right, when you move it into production, and then when you want to move it into production, it's not an easy job, right? So basically you need to package the model and uh, uh, you need to put it in, into a way where you could able to transfer it into different machines or, or pump it up into a different environments. And uh, for example, in a, in a UAT environment and validate the model, right? Just to check how good your model is. And then based on the results, you might need to fine tune the model, retrain the model. And, and, and uh, basically once the validations are good, uh, then you deploy it, right? So, so you, you'll go through all your recall scores, F1 scores, uh, and then probably if the quality is really good, finally you go ahead and then deploy the model, which is the very reason why I asked this question, right? How many of you really implemented a, a machine learning uh, 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 in production? So because that actually tells you, uh, that tells your maturity of dealing with the machine learning models. And then uh, actually the problem does not even solve if you deploy the model, right? and pretty much you need to monitor the model. So probably uh, in first few days or maybe first few months, the model will be able to give you good results when you deploy it into the production, right? You put it into a flask or an API, uh, your applications are talking to the model and then first few months it looks good. All of a sudden, what happens? Let's say for example, uh, the typical example that is happening now, right? The COVID, Correct. Uh, there is there is like a huge anomalies or huge uh, uh, discrepancies, uh, variances of of day to day uh, activities, right? So immediately your model might get impacted. So how do you make sure you mo you monitor the model uh, that are deployed in the production, right? To make sure the quality of the model is same as it was. So when you deploy it, there is also a scope of retraining here, right? With the new data, probably the new uh, new scenarios. So all in all. Uh, you know, I would say it looks simple, but by then it's insanely hard to do, right? Uh, I'm sure people have uh, mentioned that, yes, I've implemented it in the ma machine learning in the production. They would all agree with me, correct? So, which is the, uh, but by then again, uh, uh, why is it so important? And then why is it so difficult? Look at some of the nuances involved in uh, implementing a machine learning, right? So first of all, you should have a software development kits, notebooks, wizards, uh, uh, and and then basically you should have something like a, a development environment kits uh, where you develop the model, and and so on and so forth of the fundamental uh, the development uh, workbench. And then on top of that, you should have a data management. Basically, you need to profile and label the data if you're talking about a supervised learning. And then most importantly, you'll be able to do the experiments, right? Can you put up a, can you pick up a small data and then run and do the experiment and uh, build the models and then finalize the models. And then not just that, you need to manage the models using the various versions, right? For example, my version one of the model is giving you a good F1, F1 score, but by then a, a, a lower a recall score, right? But in the model two, right? Uh, so when I, when I train with a different type of uh, parameters, uh, uh, it, it's, it's giving me a better accuracy, right? So all that model management versioning is also important. And then, uh, so once you have that, you need to serve it in a real time using the, you, you, using the production instances, right? That's where your model servicing comes into the play. And then uh, also, uh, as I said, right, some of the uh, aspects of the training, it might be like very, very heavy. I'll, I'll talk you through about this in the different section, but it's gonna be very heavy. Correct. That means you need a huge computing power clusters and uh, you know the distributed learning uh, to train the models at a very accurate and faster pace.
correct? So uh, computers, computer is also one of the nuance uh, that are associated in the uh, machine learning model. And then orchestration, so you need to have, you need to manage the security and you need to package it, deploy it, you do all the kind of smoke tests, uh, vulnerability tests, uh, and make sure the code is, is, is not prone to any of the cyber, cyber uh, attacks. And then, and then probably then you'll be able to either package it uh, in an on-premise solution or probably in a cloud, right? Or in some of the cases, uh, an edge computing device. So, so basically, uh, uh, you'll use it uh, on 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 a particular device. So I'll again, I'll talk you I'll talk you through what that is. So uh, all in all, uh, uh, it's amalgamation of various uh, aspects uh, that that will lead to a successful machine learning implementation. And imagine as an enterprise, if you're uh, uh, implementing the machine learning, dealing with all this, right? It's 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 not so easy. So, which is the very reason why we, uh, which is the very reason why uh, we have come up with a framework, or probably uh, uh, you know the, the the trend around machine learning is, how do we automate these uh, machine learning operations? Basically, how do we bring machine learning uh, into the production in a more automated way? So that's that's the machine learning ops. So whatever you're able to see here. So how do you make sure you you put it into something like an automated pipeline? So wherein you just have to worry about a, a manual aspects in the few uh, few portions of it, and then rest all is like all, all, all almost automated. So which is where this machine learning ops will come into the picture. So uh, to me, it's it's three P's, right? So it's nothing but the people, process, and the platform. So uh, wherein uh, what do you need to do? You need to blend together a work. Uh, you need to you need to come up with a bunch of people, you know, uh, who who could able to uh, inculcate this new culture, uh, who could able to undergo this change process. And uh, the second is obviously uh, uh, how do you make sure these core data models and trainings are built into form of like a pipelines, more like a process. And then also template, uh, you know, build it into a template and make sure you use it in a reusable solution and then automate the entire machine learning life cycle. So that means all the aspects that you've uh, seen here, train the model, package the model, validate the model, deploy the model and monitor the model uh, uh, through these nuances, automatic end-to-end -end is what you call uh, as an MLOps. And then uh, for all this, uh, the critical aspects is you need to have a right platforms and uh, uh, you know right uh, right uh, uh, technology in place to make sure uh, you manage it end to end. Correct. So to me, if you want to automate the machine learning process or machine learning operations, it's about first bringing that culture and then uh, setting up the right people, and then you should have like a right process in place. So how do you make sure? Uh, uh, re how do you reuse? Uh, the code and probably how do you make sure you you package it uh, uh, in a much more uh, reusable manner, and and uh, think about thinking about uh, a culture around how do you automate it from end to end and then package everything through a platform. So overall, uh, these three aspects uh, will will drive the ML ops right. Uh, once again, reiterating, ML ops is nothing but bringing the ML model into the production in a more automated way as possible, as much as automated way as possible. And then, uh, so when you're talking about a machine learning uh, ML ops, right? So let's say if you want to package it into a more automated pipeline, uh, uh, I've already given, uh, I've already talked about different components that might come into play, nuances which we explained in the slide. And this particular slide will focus on what are the different layers uh, uh, that are associated uh, in an ML ops implementation, right? So first and foremost, you should you should have a use case, correct? And then once you have a use case, uh, you need to do the data discovery, keep the data, as I mentioned, and then you need to work on the training, correct? And then the third layer is platform. Make sure, uh, so you have like a framework or probably a, a kind of a machine learning architecture to train these models. Uh, I'll give you an example, right? For example, frameworks, uh, so you have like the TensorFlow and PyTorch uh, kind of a frameworks, right? And then when it comes to a platform, where are you gonna uh, you know, build, build and operate this? And architecture here, again, I'm referring to the AI architecture. So meaning uh, how your neural network, if you're implementing a deep learning solutions, how do your neural network architecture look like? Uh, again, I can give you examples, right? Anything related to the images, uh, if you would go with something called convolutional neural networks, uh, anything to do with uh, text processing, you use natural language processing. Predominantly, I think uh, some of the architectures around is, uh, you know, uh, the, the long-term short-term memory, uh, probably bi-directional uh, encoders, like the BERT models, which are pretty predominant. So it talks about the architecture, right? And then methods. So basically, so how do you combine uh, various algorithms, frameworks, and architecture? and then stitch it together into, into, a, into a method, right? 
And then once that is done, interface, right? So basically this model has to in interact with some of my applications, for example, if I might need to fetch data uh, uh, from a website, correct? Or probably uh, I, I, I can pump the data into form of a flask container from which, uh, uh, you know, we can, we, can, we can connect and play around, right? So that's, that's important aspect as well. But most important, uh, one of the other important angle, right? So people think that algorithms, architecture and framework are main drivers of the uh, machine learning, but uh, equally important is your hardware, correct? So how do you make sure your head node uh, uh, is like really working well? Then how do you accelerate uh, your machine learning implementation, right? And then, uh, so basically, uh, uh, when it comes to the hardware, you need to think about four important components in the uh, machine learning, correct? So uh, this is very critical. Uh, it, uh, so uh, these four components, right? No matter if you get a different frameworks or if you're working with a, a advanced architectures tomorrow, these particular uh, dynamics around uh, uh, the four uh, hardware aspects is not going to change. It's going to remain uh, remain uh, uh, in the future as well, right? So pretty much uh, there might be an optimization in each of these companies. First and foremost, memory, correct? So basically uh, for your short-term uh, storage, right? So, so the, the, the methods and calls and then... Uh, the, the neural feeding that is happening in the machine learning model, you need to have like a short-term memory, uh, which is very critical, right? Uh, and then storage. So, and then basically uh, storage is a critical aspect of the hardware, right from your data types where you store, uh, or maybe if you're looking at a big data, probably you, you have an electronic repository of all the data sets. And then, uh, even the machine learning models that are trained, uh, uh, the, the training, uh, the end pickle files and all that, you need to store it somewhere and then use it uh, uh, to, to uh, feed it into an API to, to, to give a calls and then operate it in the, in the production, correct? And then third one is obviously the logic. So meaning, uh, how, is, how is your processing power, right? So is, do you have like a uh, good processing power that are, that, are, that are being used? Especially does your processing power allows the parallel uh, training, et cetera, or some of the critical aspects of the hardware. And then of course, last but not the least, networking switches, routers, and other equipment, right? That pretty much links to the servers. This is again, the fourth component is very critical in two aspects. One is, let's say if you're operating or implementing this machine learning solution, not on premise, right? But by then in a cloud, so then the networking should be even more uh, uh, critical. And then I would uh, talk you through in the next slide, right? Networking is critical when you even further expand your machine learning model onto an edge-based solution, correct? So, so let me quickly go into the next slide, right? So in the hardware, the four components that I talked about, let, let us now relate it on how uh, uh, we, can, we can implement it on a machine learning uh, lifecycle. I'm sure you've seen this slide, training, packaging, validating, deploying, and monitoring, right? Uh, this is again, uh, people who have implemented the machine learning solution in the production, right? I'm sure they agree with you. Maybe you can leave comments uh, as I speak. Uh, if you agree with me, right? The critical aspects of, uh, 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 of a machine learning model, right? Basically where hardware uh, uh, you know, plays a really crucial game is around training the model, correct? And then also deploying the model. Correct. When I say training the model here, uh, what, uh, as I said, right, let's say uh, uh, most of these architectures, uh, AI architectures and machine learning architectures. So what they would do, they would uh, convert uh, your entire data set into uh, uh, vectors. So probably uh, they would they would uh, convert into numbers and then probably then then tokenize it and then build it into vectors and then they do all the matrix uh, calculations, right, in a, in a form of a neural network. So imagine the bigger the input is, or probably the, the bigger the training model is, the harder it is uh, for you uh, to accelerate uh, the machine learning model, correct? So basically this is where your acceleration is very important. So here, uh, um, next slide, I can definitely take you through uh, different type of the architectures require different type of uh, hardware uh, acceleration cap uh, requirements, right? Uh, and also, uh, if you could able to parallelize your AI architecture or not, also defines your hardware here. And then this is a biggest market in the AI, right? So pretty much all the semiconductor market is being driven by the acceleration in training the model, correct? So uh, so what I've been hearing in the market, uh, you know, we have something called AI chips now, 
correct. And then GPUs is pretty pretty obvious. So whenever you want to train a very powerful machine learning model, a graphic processing unit, so which was predominantly used in the gaming and all, right? It's, it's quite critical. Uh, at least you need to have that in some of the cases. And uh, but the world is uh, also moving uh, slowly into the AI related chips. Also, I've been hearing neural network processes. So remember, one of the component that I said is a is a is a logic, right? So basically, your processing power. So there is a specific chips built uh, or a specific processes built for the neural networks. And then uh, I'm not sure uh, how many of you heard about tensor processing units by Google. And then uh, FBGA, right? So this is basically almost like your Lego uh, type of model. So basically you can you could able to uh, uh, build your own uh, type of uh, the processing powers. Uh, so basically the flexible gate array is, uh, is, is what it is. And then high bandwidth memory. Uh, so as I said, uh, memory is one of the important components of the model. So, and then especially the short term memory is, 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 is critical, right? So basically this high bandwidth memory will provide the in, in memory processing on the chip itself, right? So that means when you're, when you're doing the calculations, so the bandwidth in which it operates is, is like very heavy. And then uh, we also have uh, CUDA based architectures. So basically CUDA based capabilities uh, from NVIDIA, which gives you the distributed learning. Let's say if I have to train a machine learning model, I can slice it, slice it into, uh, you know, into a, a, a multiple pieces and then probably train it and then uh, uh, centralize uh, the learning. This is what is called as a distributed learning. Probably you can refer to the internet uh, to, to learn more about this. And uh, Actually, one of the most innovative uh, things happening in the industry is about the quantum computing. Correct. So some of the use cases, especially uh, around uh, those that could be, uh, uh, you know, improved by factoring. This is where your quantum computing uh, related architectures will play. So this is in a very, very uh, niche uh, stage. Uh, it's like, almost, I would say the baby steps at the moment. Uh, we still don't have a, a commercial quantum computer yet available in the market, right? But once that is available, at least these factor-based algorithms that you're building is like a pretty much, uh, you know, we're talking about increasing at a, at a two to the power of N, uh, 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 N kind of an improvement. So because uh, it works on a concept called qubits, so wherein it, 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 uh, the, the qubit stays in multiple uh, states at any given point of time. I'm not getting into there. Again, you can refer to the uh, concepts of uh, the internet or concepts uh, uh, available offline or online. Uh, but that's, that's been predominantly uh, going to revolutionize uh, your uh, acceleration in the uh, machine learning models, right? Uh, in the upcoming, uh, at least I would say five to 10 years down the line, I'm sure. So everybody should be using like quantum computers uh, to, to train a factorial based uh, machine learning models. So that's the training part, right? And then packaging and validating, I'm not saying it's not critical, but that's also important. But when it comes to the hardware, right? The other challenge or our most crucial component is again, deploying the model. Uh, so if you're just deploying it uh, for your internal use, maybe web-based applications, it's, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's not that tough, not that easy, pretty much there. But imagine if you have to use it uh, in an edge device. What do I mean by edge device? Let's say, uh, how many of you heard about a Tesla, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call the car, right? Uh, uh, so basically this is AI based car and then without humans driving, probably it has got the capabilities to drive itself, right? So it's, it's like a self driving car. So here, uh, so basically it's a device. So basically it's an edge, it's kind of a device, right? So basically you're in, uh, deploying your machine learning models uh, you know, to work in a car. So in that case, right, it's, it's critical. I mean, uh, your regular hardware does not work. So which is where uh, you, you have something called uh, application specific integrated circuits, right? AS, AS, ASICs. Correct, and then in the car itself, you need to have some kind of like a computing power uh, to do immediate real-time machine learning calculations. So and then uh, uh, predominantly you need something like a neuromorphic chips uh, in the car. So wherein uh, I train a model somewhere else, but by then I still need to execute it at real time without any problem in the car. And then uh, also uh, very, very important, right? What is the objective of the deployment, especially in the edge device? Criticality, that means it should not go wrong, correct? and latency. So that means it needs to react uh, in, a, in, in a split second, right? Imagine uh, if you're going in a self, uh, uh, the driverless cars and probably you saw a red light and then you need to take the decision in the split second and then the car should stop. So that's why the latency is very critical. Whenever you talk about the latency, which is where the networking component, which I mentioned before in the previous slide is important. 
So most of these edge devices, right, they could able to perform really well uh, if you're operating uh, with something like the 5G network, correct? Uh, 5G is uh, also another key driver. At least it's going to be another key driver uh, going forward. Okay, so uh, uh, again, uh, if you're if you're, if I think I'm going at a very fast pace, probably you can leave a comment and then I can slow it down. But otherwise, uh, we pretty much covered uh, some of the important uh, concepts and topic until now. Okay. So again, uh, remember what I said. So basically, uh, so depending on the uh, depending on the you know use cases that you have in the machine learning, probably that defines uh, or probably the stage in which you you're using the machine learning. Right for training the machine learning, I'm only speaking from a training perspective, or probably uh, the validation perspective. Right. So different type of uh, uh, use cases will have uh, require different type of uh, computing power. For instance, as I said, right, the route planning applications have different needs for processing speed. But if you're talking about the autonomous driving or if you're calculating the financial risk of a particular instrument, correct, at a real time, it requires a different type of a computing power. So which is where, uh, uh, this is a quick reference again, uh, uh, where you could see here, right, uh, something like a language translation or probably speech understanding. So here, uh, uh, the low cost of development is pretty low, but by then you need a heavy uh, processing speed to train the model. But if you see the route planning and optimization, right, you'd need a, a lesser computing power to train. But however, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, when when it comes to the processing uh, uh, spend or a, or a small size form factor, right, probably that's that's more important. So that's 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 very critical in terms of the hardware, and. Uh, uh, Autonomous driving, as, as I was mentioned here, it's an edge device, so which falls into the second category into my previous slide. GPUs and then uh, CPUs might not might not uh, work there. Right? You need ASIs, so meaning application-specific integrated circuits. That means circuits that are built to drive uh, the, the machine learning in the autonomous car. So something like this is like really, really uh, necessary. So again, depending on the use case, uh, so basically you have a different uh, uh, type of a training and uh, inference requirement here. Correct. Uh, again, this is a very uh, quick, uh, the same thing instead of the use case, right? The type of the machine learning model that you're using or a machine learning approach. Remember, the, uh, I said there is an approach that we need to take. So each each approach, uh, again, should have a different type of uh, uh, computing power that are required. The minimum requirement and maximum requirement has been uh, 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 put across here. Uh, for example, as, as, as I was mentioning, right? Anything uh, that is uh, parallelized, that means you could be able to run in a distributed learning. So that means I can train one mega model into smaller chunks across different machines. So you can use a multi GPUs and then multi CPU kind of a setup. But some of the uh, some of the use cases, right? You will be never able to do the parallel training. In this case, I, uh, the K nearest neighbors are are probably uh, uh, you know something like your extreme gradient boostings and all that, right? So probably you'll you'll never be able to do uh, a parallelized computing there. So it's like a basically you need to run either on a single GPU or a single uh, CPU. So uh, again, this basic generalized point of view, it might differ from uh, infra uh, needs of your company, right? Just use this as a quick reference. But I think critical point here is, uh, depending on the type of the use case, depending on the stage in which uh, your machine learning model is, and then the approach that you take pretty much will define your hardware. Just wanna reiterate on this point, right? So pretty much now I'm covering the training uh, portion of the uh, uh, hardware now. So let's say now, uh, uh, let's say again in the training, right? Uh, or, or even uh, uh, when you wanna implement this solution, most of the, the trend that is going so far is, you know, to go with the hybrid or public cloud solution. Okay. So uh, when you're going with the hybrid or public cloud solution, one second, give me a moment. Okay, sorry. I was just checking if uh, the recording is on or not. Uh, <clears throat> be good. Let's uh, get back, right? Uh, uh, what's been the trend, right? So, I mean, uh, remember what I told? I mean, we need to have our GPUs, we need to have our CPUs, ASICs. 
some of the organizations, right? So they don't want to take that responsibility of managing all that, correct? And then especially today, uh, the software, uh, sorry, the hardware requirements might be this, but tomorrow there might be a different hardware requirements. Correct, you need a different type of a memory. Uh, one way uh, that you deal with this constant uh, changes, uh, you take the help of a cloud solutions provider, right? Either it's a hybrid cloud or a public cloud, AWS, Amazon, Google, Ali, Ali Cloud and then implement the solution in your cloud, correct? So that actually takes care of, uh, you know, uh, worry around what kind of an architecture that you need to use. And probably if something changes tomorrow, so probably your, uh, uh, your cloud computing uh, solution provider will be able to help you in this case, correct? So, but by then it comes with key challenges. Uh, again, I'm not gonna spend much time. Uh, probably you could take a note, so probably you can take the material. Uh, I would see if I can touch base on the critical points here. Uh, think about, you know, inconsistent model development lifecycle. So basically, let's say if you're pushing, uh, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're using an ML ops, right? Make sure you automate the pipeline for the continuous model training and the deployment. So that is important aspect. And then data governance and local data regulations, right? And some of these cloud solutions are sitting outside your country. Uh, for example, if you take Indonesia or Taiwan, Correct. So you, you're not supposed to move the data out. So most of the confidential information or some of the critical information should should stay within the country, right? So you need to take care of all that. So probably you need to automate some something like a data quality checks to make sure you're adhering to the data policies. And uh, uh, this is what I experience day in day out, right? Inconsistent performance drifts. This is also remember what I said before. Let's say if your model might perform good today, but by then it might dip tomorrow, right? So, which is the very reason why you need to have a proactive based monitoring for your machine learning model. So, uh, especially uh, what we what we find out, at least my experience, the reason why the performance drips is, you'll be surprised because of the hardware degradation, right? It might happen. So it's, 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 I mean, that's my experience. So probably that's why, that is a very reason why if you're going with a hybrid or a public cloud solution, you definitely need to have a, a, a monitoring solution uh, to, to check the performance and especially related to the hardware health. So it's not just the model health, but also the hardware health is critical. And then uh, you also need to uh, uh, implement the sensitivity of the thresholds. Uh, you need to think about explainability of the models. Uh, and then important uh, important factor I would touch base is the sixth. You need to have a, uh, you don't, you should not, if you have a decentralized model training, uh, then you're not, you're not actually running the ML ops effectively, right? Probably you need to centralize all the model training for a better visibility. So that's my lesson learned. So even though there'll be like a bunch of scientists working in a federated way at multiple places, so, but make sure you provide them an infrastructure, a centralized infrastructure where they could be able to train. Even, it, even if it is an on-premise solution, so probably you can think about uh, uh, connected networks, right? Uh, a centralized uh, uh, workbench. So where they will, where they able to train the models. That way, right, you'll have a good visibility on model validation. This is even critical in the uh, uh, public and hybrid cloud because of the cost involved, right? So to train a machine learning model in the cloud, right, it's always expensive, especially let's say if you have to train, retrain, do all the experimentations, right? If you don't have a proper control over here, or if you don't have a centralized way, so you end up paying a huge bill uh, to the cloud providers. And then it's inefficient, right? So that's why you need to centralize all the model uh, learning. And then you need to think about edge from the beginning, correct? So when you have the use case, make sure, uh, think about like, like, like let's say, uh, even for a simple use case like financial risk analysis. So think about, uh, uh, see if I need to use this on a mobile devices, correct? Or probably do I need to uh, uh, implement in uh, maybe uh, trading terminals like Bloomberg, et cetera. Right? So basically that's also edge devices. So edge devices, think about the edge strategy from the beginning. Don't uh, wait until you get an edge, edge case and then uh, probably respond. Good practice is always think and have some basic infrastructure ready for the edge. And then make sure you think about the parallelization, auto elastic and scaling, and then uh, basically you optimize your cost efficiencies, which is why the right sizing of uh, the cloud is also critical. Correct. So these are some of the pointers around uh, how do you uh, uh, use uh, the combinations of uh, the hybrid and public cloud and then make sure you mitigate all these challenges. So that's the training portion itself, right? I mean, it also touch, touches some bit of the deployment, uh, but otherwise it's, it's pretty common. 
let's get into the next important topic: edge devices. So, uh, uh, team. So this is this is interesting, right? Uh, most of the uh, most of the um, AI use cases, machine learning use cases, are moving to the edge. So you might avoid it today, but definitely you might not be able to avoid it tomorrow, right? So it ha it will be definitely integrated onto the day-to-day -day devices that we use. So what is edge? Basically, it's uh, edge computing is nothing but a distributed computing uh, that brings onto the edge uh, the end devices, right? So maybe something like your smart TV, smart washing machines, uh, probably even phones with a uh, some of the phones, the camera, right? It has got some AI features. So if you try to uh, flash it out, it detects the face and probably some of the advanced phones will be able to detect uh, the trees and then persons and human beings. That's very a simple example, but by then most advanced example as I was talking about is the drones. You use the drones to deliver the products, especially this, this is gonna be like emerging uh, in the uh, era of COVID. Uh, and then edge ML ops is nothing but ML ops. So meaning you uh, automate the continuous integration and then uh, continuous development and operations onto the edge devices. And then it's not simple. So basically uh, it's different uh, when you do it uh, compared to the other, uh, uh, the usual ML ops, right? So which is what I'm gonna uh, take you through in the next slide. So what is the difference between uh, usual ML ops and then what do you mean by the edge ML ops? I'm sure you, you are aware of the top, uh, the, the, uh, the picture, right? So pretty much any machine learning model, you do it in a cloud or a data center, you train the model, package, validate, deploy, and then you have a machine learning model. But when it comes to the edge, right? So you pretty much uh, embed or integrate this machine learning model onto an edge device. So which meaning there should be a facility or, or a more like a, a, a kind of a capability in the device itself to make sure this machine learning model will be run at a real time. And then the data preparation here in the edge device is nothing but the streaming data that it is receiving. For example, if you're talking about a drone, so from camera, uh, you know, all the details that it is receiving, uh, probably from the GPS, it could be able to uh, receive a navigation and all that. And then it might receive some commands from the command center. So all that stream of the data is what it comes here. And then it, it feds into a in build or, or, or edge computing uh, machine learning model. And then it executes real time on the edge device. So, so pretty much uh, your uh, self-driving cars uh, or uh, all these uh, drone deliveries, smart drone deliveries, uh, you know, pretty much the, that's the edge computing examples, right? So meaning the inference and then execution happens in the edge devices. So meaning there should be a, a computing power to hold the machine learning model and execute the machine learning model. Uh, simple home-based example is, let's say if I have my, uh, if I have a simple camera, uh, if I connect it to my Raspberry Pi or uh, NVIDIA NANDOM, correct? And then if I train a, a face recognition model uh, in these devices, and then put it into a door, right? Package it nicely and put it into a door. If a person comes, automatically it detects the person and then probably it intimates to your uh, mobile phone. So that's a simple example of running an edge, uh, edge device, correct? So, uh, but uh, let, me, let me walk you through some of the more complicated cases, right? Uh, but I think the concept is this, you train the model somewhere, but by then you inference it and execute it onto the edge. That's, that's what is called as edge ML ops. And then the continuous automation of all this is edge ML ops. So uh, thanks to Qualcomm, uh, I'm gonna take care of the Qualcomm uh, Snapdragon 8 solution, right? So here it's a simple example. So what's happening is uh, uh, here, they are bringing the AI capabilities to its processes, kind of the Qual Qualcomm Snapdragon processes. How do they do it? Uh, pretty much again, two stage model, right? They have a machine learning model that is being built at a data center using the deep learning frameworks, like for example, CAFE or a TensorFlow, they test the model, train the model, select the right approach, select the right architecture. And then if the model is good enough, what they would do is that the, the Qualcomm itself uh, has something called uh, an SDK, a software development kit, which converts the file into a, a Qualcomm neural processing engine uh, that can be read by the Qual uh, Qualcomm neural processing engine. And then basically that engine will optimize uh, the tool and then uh, it, 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 it optimizes the file. And then pretty much that file is what is uh, uh, you know being pumped or, or sending to the mobile devices through some networks. Uh, uh, so I can share the link later, right? So pretty much uh, 
uh, otherwise, uh, it's a simple example of a uh, simple concept of the edge ML ops. The continuous model happens in the data center. The moment the model is good, automatically it pushes into an SDK uh, that converts the uh, the file into into uh, uh, some through an API. Right? It, uh, it it converts into a uh, into a file that can be readable by the neural processing engine. Then probably it reads and then it optimizes and then it it it, it fine tunes the file. And then uh, that particular file has been pumped onto the mobile. Use cases are very, very uh, heavy. Uh, for example, some of these advanced Qualcomm Snapdragon uh, you know, phones, uh, maybe that you are aware of in the market, uh, that you get in the uh, Android-based uh, phones, right? So you could you could uh, relate uh, some of the works that it do. For example, intelligently it'll check if your phone battery power is not optimized. Intelligently, it'll be able to check uh, if uh, if your uh, phone is having a heavy pressure in terms of the gaming, or probably the kind of work that you're doing uh, that you're doing on it, and automatically optimizes the loads. Right, so the use cases are pretty heavy, or, or, or pretty large, I would say. Right, and then I still uh, they just uh, you know again initial phases, uh, they're going to expand it to much more uh, mobile operations uh, going forward. Correct. So that's that's one uh, classic example, and then my favorite is uh, the drone delivery. So basically, this again the following il illustration will talk to you about how do you make sure you bring in that continuous training of the model uh, 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 at the data center to your edge device. In this case, the edge device is the drone. Correct. Uh, because of the COVID, uh, some of the countries are uh, trying to deliver the goods or probably even transport the people using drones. Uh, but uh, as simple as it might sound, but it's it's actually not right. It's a complicated architecture. So what happens here is, uh, as you can see in the center, you have the drone. Uh, it has got different components of it, right? It has got a camera, it has got a sensors, GPS, and then it has got its own inbuilt edge computing. Uh, probably it might be a Raspberry Pi, or probably a, a NVIDIA a GPU card with the execution capabilities, right? So so what happens here is. So it has got some kind of an inbuilt uh, machine learning models. Basically, if you have a camera, you understand some vision, and then probably you can detect uh, who that is, and probably uh, your GPS will have your navigation, right? Probably a machine learning model is built to take the optimized route, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, right? But real challenges with the problem, right? Uh, pro uh, real challenges or problems with the drone is anomalies. So something that is not trained, you know, which has been uh, faced by the drone. For example, it is trying to deliver a package into a building and then there's a fire in the building, then what it what it's supposed to do? It can detect the fire maybe, so it probably can say that, okay, there's a fire here. But can it take a real-time decision instead of, uh, you know, uh, can, can it take a real-time decision with the help of a command center instead of not delivering, returning back uh, probably to the, to its vehicle or probably to its resting place? So how does the model works? As, as I mentioned in the picture, right? Look at the uh, maroon lines. So basically all the data, right? The machine learning uh, decisions that the drone is taking, sensors data, camera data, GPS data, battery health, all these are streamed uh, through in real time using my, leveraging my 5G network, right? Through uh, to an edge-based cloud. And then through the IoT gateway, that edge-based cloud will send it to the IoT hub in my command center. So IoT hub, what it will do first, it will store all the information. So that means it will keep all the existing logs and then as it is. And then in parallel, all the stored information has been pushed into the machine learning models. And then what it will do, uh, uh, it has got an inbuilt anomaly detection and threat detection and all the other aspects, right? Anything that is not common to what the drone is supposed to take, it will uh, send a notification to the notification hub. And then the notification hub uh, will monitor the auto machine learning uh, retraining that has happened or probably even what they could do here, they could they could send a manual command saying that and navigate back to the same original position, right? And then in case, uh, if it is a simple command, it's it's, it's easy, uh, it, this, here the, send, the drone will receive it and then come back. In some cases, right, it might require uh, for, for it to retrain the model, right? Uh, and then quickly send it to the drone. Correct. Uh, so in this case, what also happens, as you see in the orange line, it get the model gets trained. The RTML uh, solution that they might have, you know, retrains uh, the the machine learning model, and then uh, pumps that end pickle file or or inference model uh, through the green channel, meaning the 5G network, uh, the edge cloud will receive it and then immediately push it uh, push it down to the uh, uh, push it down to the drone, uh, uh, and then it could help them. To, to take the uh, you know, new execution, probably a better execution, correct? So as you can see, right, this is all happening in, in continuous manner. 
and then not just that uh, it, it is uh, getting integrated into an edge device like a drone uh, slightly more complicated. It might sound so simple, but by then in reality, it might not be the case, right? So I'm not getting into, again, practical difficulties uh, in this drone solution. So uh, you know, we're uh, we trying to do this, but by then we're still not there, right? So that means you you face lots of challenges. Uh, probably I'm not gonna take you, uh, take it down there uh, with the event of the time that we might have, uh, but uh, I'm writing a blog on this. So probably I can share uh, the link, uh, the LinkedIn and, and uh, the Medium, uh, you know, uh, article on this. So these are the two complicated use cases where the hardware component is critical. In this case, as you could see, right, the IoT gateways, the 5G networks, even the edge clouds, your your uh, machine learning models that are sitting in the command centers, the edge computing devices inside the sensors, the hardware uh, orchestration is very critical in the edge ML ops, especially in the drone delivery. Uh, drone delivery. So with this, uh, probably I think uh, we pretty much covered all the knowledge path that I mentioned initially. And uh, so the key takeaway, well, let me just wrap up the points and then uh, we're there, right? Uh, the key takeaway here is, uh, you know, the ML systems are inher inherently different to the traditional software. So that's why the normal CICD would not work, right? So you need to get in uh, something like a machine learning operations. So what do you mean by that? It's nothing but to me, uh, bringing uh, the, the machine learning model into production in a more automated way. How is it possible? It's basically people process platform problem. Uh, so if you could able to resolve one by one, so you could able to, uh, uh, you know, able to build a machine learning operation solution. Uh, again, I'm not talking about the tools. There are various tools that are available in the market to do this. For example, Databricks, uh, H2O.ei, the Taiku, so unified platforms that are there. And then in, in all this, let's say, if you want to implement your own solutions, right? So uh, basically the hardware plays a critical part in the ML ops architecture. Remember the four components of the hardware uh, that I talked about, the storage, logic, uh, uh, the basically the, the, the processing power and the memory, right? So these four components are very critical uh, and then it plays hands in hand uh, uh, in the ML ops architecture. And then especially the type of uh, the processing power and then the type of the memory that is required uh, changes across the different stages of machine learning. The most critical aspects are the model training and the deployment. Remember the quick reference that I shared. So depending on the use case and then depending, depending on the approach, you should plan your hardware according. And then think about cloud. So basically all these uh, uh, can be automated, right? So the selection of the hardware and all, it's, it's pretty headache. So you can leave it on to the cloud uh, providers uh, to give you the right solution. So, but by then if you're thinking about the hybrid cloud, so what is really important is you need to have, the, you know, to think about edge from the beginning, right? Hardware sizing, and then think about all the other key challenges that I just explained. And then last but not the least, uh, ML is gaining real prominence in the edge computing, autonomous cars, drones, right? I and mean, it's gonna go, uh, go over and over uh, in the coming period. And then which is why the edge ML ops uh, is critical to automate the CI CD capabilities in the edge. And then this will only be possible if you could able to orchestrate your hardware really well. So probably I think uh, this is what I wanted to convey today. Hopefully I covered all the knowledge path that I mentioned uh, previously. And uh, hopefully you had a, a knowledgeful uh, session today. Uh, so I'm then happy to take any other questions that you might have. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's my pleasure uh, talking to you today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.